Let's, let's do something a little different, all right? Let's do something a little different today. Sometimes we need to mix it up. See, a lot of times it becomes very predictable. Amen? Okay, you're going to have to say amen more than that, or I, you're going to mess me up. <laughs> amen. I, I'm an evangelist by nature, and uh, I need a little affirmation every once in a while. Amen. So, so we're going to kind of mix it up a little bit today. I, I, I feel a sense of where the Lord wants to go. And uh, so there's a lot of things we could do. Uh, I do things a little different now that I'm a little older. Um, I just kind of get a sense of where the Holy Ghost wants to go, what he wants to do. And then I ask him to give me the right path, the thought to get there, the thought to express to get there. So your, your pastor, before I walked up here, was talking about the importance of you accepting the word. And uh, you can't overemphasize that. And it's very important that you understand that your obedience to the word of God determines everything. It determines everything. It is better to obey than to sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. So it's very important for a church to learn that principle that, you know, when men are ministering, preaching the word, teaching the word, whatever, that it's important because it's up to the amen of the congregation. It's up to you saying, just like they said with Moses, three times Moses comes down the mountain and he tells them what God had said. And three times Israel said these words, we will hearken and we will obey. At the conclusion of the third time, the Bible says that the heavens opened. And when the heavens opened, Moses and the 70 elders and Aaron and a couple others were allowed to see into the heavens. In other words, <clears throat> the, the place, the earth was in proper alignment through obedience to the throne of God into heaven. And when that happened, then God reveals his throne to them, his authority, his power. So it's always important for the congregation once they hear the word of God. Now you have a responsibility to it. We're not up here just entertaining you. Now I know a lot of places that's the way it feels. And, uh, you know, I hear statements like this, who's your favorite preacher? Well, you know, if we go on that, John the Baptist would have been nobody's favorite preacher. But the fact is, is God sends his word to us to challenge us, to correct us, chastise us, edify us, rebuke us, amen, for the edifying of the body. Now, if you don't learn to accept that and make the adjustments to align yourself in obedience to that, then you're kind of like what James said. You're just looking into the perfect law of liberty, forgetting what you read, what you've seen, and you become a deceived individual. Because every, here's the thing, once something is preached to you, you now have a responsibility to it. You're going to stand and answer for those things. And the way that God's going to ask you is, is what did you do with what I told you? Well, praise God. And if you want to hear him say, well done, there's some more that goes with it, thou good and faithful servant. So we're faithful to the word of God. We're faithful to the things of God. It's important for us to realize that. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more here at the end of it. But uh, I, I want to do something a little different. And uh, I, I want to take this observation, all right? Uh, thank God for the communion today, and uh, we are always to remember, to remember his broken body. I also think that communion ought to be a time of healing. First Passover, when they got ready to leave, the blood's applied and all that, the Bible says they left Egypt and there was not a sick or feeble person with them. So when the first Passover took place, there was a mass healing that took place. So I think that any time that we're truly discerning his body, there ought to be number two things ought to happen, healing and forward movement. It ought to happen every time we take communion, Passover, whatever you want to call it. Amen. Everybody said amen. amen. Okay, here, here's what we're going to do today. 
here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to share some things with you today. And uh, then at the end of this, I'll close it kind of where I started. Amen. Uh, I have been preaching now for 43 years. I preached my first revival when I was 17. That's 43 years ago. So I've, I've been around enough. And I've preached in all kinds of churches. I, I say this jokingly. I say, I say I've preached in, in beautiful churches. I've preached in ugly churches. I've preached in fat churches. I've preached in skinny churches. I've preached in some that thought they were a church but were deceived. Amen. I mean, I've preached in a lot of places. I could tell you a lot of funny stories in places that I've preached. Uh, I could tell you about one of my first times preaching uh, the pastor walked up and handed me a brown paper bag and said, we appreciate you being here tonight. Here's the offering. God bless you. And I think when I got out of the car and counted it, it was like $17. Amen. So anytime you walk up and hand me a brown paper bag, I just get anxiety. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> you know, flashbacks. Amen. And so... Uh, I preached. I preached for my grandparents on my mom's side. Uh, I, I preached for them. That was my first revival. Uh, once I announced my call to preach, my grandma Alfin, precious little thing. I mean, she just was a godly person and just sweet as she could be. Grandpa has a little different story, but Grandma, Amen. And uh, so. Uh, after I announced my call to preach, I ceased being, I was the oldest grandchild, I ceased being Mark and become Brother Mark. And so it was weird to hear your grandparents refer to you as Brother Mark. <laughs> I've been referred to in other ways, amen. And uh, so, you know, I preached for them and I preached, uh, I don't know, uh, two weeks or whatever. And... Uh, she walked up and they had one of those little yellow envelopes and I'm not advocating the offering here today. That's not why I'm saying what I'm saying. Amen. But the deal is, is I, I preached for them and uh, I think it was two weeks and at the end of those two weeks, I think the offering was uh, $40 or something, you know. So, but I, I, back then it wasn't about how much money. I was just so excited to get to preach the word of God. And I still feel that way. And uh, so, you know, I've, I mean, I've preached in churches. I mean, uh, I've preached in churches that were family owned and operated. <laughs> You'll catch that one here in a little bit. Amen. And uh, I mean, I've preached in churches where people were so stinking territorial. I mean, you know, that's my piano. Don't touch it. I've even seen places to where they had uh, markers on their pews, uh, their names, this is where they sat. And God forbid that your visitor didn't know the system and you happened to sit in one of their seats because they'd tell you you need to move. I've preached in churches to where they had become so stuck, I mean just stuck in their routines and their traditions. Uh, I was preaching in a town in southeast Missouri and Man, it just like we couldn't get anywhere. And so I was getting ready to read my text, and I got a little inspiration, and I said, hey, I'm going to ask everybody that's sitting on this side to move over this side and vice versa. And so, you know, they all kind of looked at me like, you've lost your ever-loving mind. And I said, no, really, let's just do this today. Let's just switch sides. And there's a lady sitting on the second pew. She was... Uh, uh, well, anyway, she was. And uh, <clears throat> I heard her say, I'm not moving. <laughs> and uh, at least she had enough gumption to say it. You know, a lot of people, they'll, they'll think stuff, but they just don't have enough nerve to say it sometimes. But she did. So she just, I'm not moving. So politely I asked again, I, please, I'm asking everybody on this side to move over to this side and vice versa. And she said out loud, I told you I'm not moving. <laughs> and I'm just telling you, I, I, I could read the next day's headlines in the local newspaper. 
crazy pen preacher, Pentecostal preacher goes crazy, kills fat old lady on the second pew. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but I reined it in and got calm and, you know, and I looked at her. I said, well, just sit wherever you want to sit, you know. But it, it was crazy because just that simple little act of obedience. I mean, as soon as everybody except sister, I ain't moving, it, it exploded. I mean, it exploded. I think that next week we had, I don't remember, it was like 12, 14 people get the Holy Ghost. And uh, it just, you know, because if we're not careful, and I've preached a lot of churches, they get stuck in this. See, a church has to determine, it has to determine what it wants. It has to have something clear in sight. What kind of journey are we on as a church if we don't have a destination in mind? What does that destination look like? You know, it's, you, you, we're crazy. I use this analogy all the time. Thank God for GPS. I'm glad for GPS. Now, I wish I could figure out how to change Siri's voice from female to a masculine male voice because I got all kinds of women at home telling me how to drive and all this stuff and all. And so, but I, <laughs> I thank God for it. And, uh, you know, this morning I got ready to leave and I thought, man, I can't remember their address. So I... I called Claire and I said, Claire, I need uh, Pritt's address, the church over there. In a few seconds, I get a text, boom. And, and I just hit the little deal and GPS come on. And, uh, you know, now here's the thing. GPS doesn't work too good if when it's asking you for a destination, you put in it, I don't know. Don't care. Just take me wherever you want to take me today. It's kind of like the old man that had Alzheimer's, and, and I did not say that disrespectful. My mom has it. But the true story, he, he walked away from the home he was in, and they couldn't find him. Two or three days, they finally found him and asked him where he had been. And his reply was, well, I, I rightly don't know, but you don't have to know where you're at to be there. <laughs> and so I think sometimes that kind of summarizes. And so what God does is God creates through his word, vision, prophetic preaching, he creates a destination. He starts painting to the congregation the destination. This is what we can do. This is where we need to go. This is what God has for us. Now, at that point, it's up to us to own that. It's not just going to happen. Uh, we, we have to own that. We have to buy into that. We have to invest in that. So here, here's something that I, I want to share with you today. Uh, so I, I, I've evangelized probably more than anything else. And uh, 19, is this okay if I give a little history and all? So in 1983, going into 84, I started evangelizing. Uh, charity was... Uh, not even born yet. And so uh, I started evangelizing and God was good to me. I started out, I, I went from 19, the end of 1983, the beginning of 84, all the way through to May of 1988 when I took the church in Oklahoma. So about four years in there I evangelized. In 1992, uh, God opened some doors to me. He sent word to me that I needed to set my house in order that I was about to get extremely busy. And it happened. 1992, it just avalanched. And I mean, I got busy. And uh, matter of fact, this is when I first started preaching in Modesto, revival in Modesto. And uh, we'd have services to where, I mean, just masses of people, just, just crazy stuff. Uh, I think one year, I had preached out somewhere, at least one place somewhere, 45 weeks out of the year. And uh, sometimes it was two or three places in the week. I'd go preach somewhere on a Monday, Tuesday, fly home, preach for our church on Wednesday night, and then go preach somewhere else Thursday and Friday night, drive home, go back home, preach Sunday, and just repeat that cycle over and over. Now, I will tell you, I've paid a price for that. I've paid a price for that. And looking back, if I had it to do over again, I would have limited that. Amen. Uh, but so God was very good to me. I was very fortunate. 
And uh, I have been allowed the honor to preach in what we would call some of our premier churches, our revival churches. Uh, I, I have a little different perception about things now. And, and, you know, we would say these are successful churches. But let me just tell you, in the eyes of God, success has nothing to do with numbers. Success with God is obedience. I use this analogy. If God calls you over here to build a 20,000-member church and he calls another person to go put their head in the corner back there and not move till he comes, and that man does that, I'd say, which one do you think is more successful? And most people say, well, the guy that built the 20,000 member church. I said, nope, they're both equally successful because they obeyed and did exactly what God called them to do. That's why you're not wise when you compare yourselves with somebody else because God called you to do this, he called them to do that, and you need to quit comparing yourselves. I'm giving you some good stuff already, amen. And so I, I was very privileged, uh, revival churches. Uh, I mean, I've seen services where a lot of people got the Holy Ghost. Some of the most uh, tremendous moves of God. Uh, uh, Brother God and I would preach in a lot of those churches and alternate. Sometimes we preach together revivals in these churches. And uh, so... Uh, I remember spending one solid year as an evangelist preaching in the Lake Charles for Brother Ewing. And, and I'm mentioning names that don't. But I was very privileged and very fortunate to preach in a lot of these churches. And uh, I've preached in lively churches and I've preached in dead churches. I've preached on some that weren't, uh, uh, it, well, anyhow, they were on life support. And uh, so, but here's, here's what we're going to do today. You ready? I'm going to give you my observation. After 40 years of preaching, I'm going to give you my observation of what I would call an apostolic or book of Acts church. I'm going to tell you the characteristics of that church that, that marked it. Is that fair enough? And then when I get through with this, you need to decide if you want to be that kind of a church. It's quiet in here right now. Amen. Are you ready? Is this okay? Number one. Everybody say number one. Prayer. They were praying churches. Jesus said, my house shall be known as a house of prayer. We make it a house of worship, a house of preaching, but Jesus said, my house is a house of prayer. And so if these churches always had a strong prayer network in it, they had a strong prayer team in it, uh, a lot of them before service, I can remember in Modesto especially, uh, I'd go in and I'd, Brother Keys' office was kind of up and you'd have to walk through the prayer room. And on Sunday nights, uh, you'd walk through there, there'd be literally hundreds of people in there praying, and it was fervent. And a lot of times we kind of overlooked that, but if you'll remember the tabernacle plan, it all started at the altar. You got to kill something, something's got to die. You can't get in a church service where you need to go if you don't start in the outer court with building an altar and something dying and you repenting and getting a hold of God and getting your nasty attitude and your nasty flesh out of the way. How's that? Is that crude enough for you? Amen. You just got to do it. And so these places, I mean, brother, you'd walk through there and it'd just be a roar. Uh, the, my home church, I was the drummer. Can you believe that? I was a drummer. Now, I wasn't a good drummer, but I was a drummer. Amen. And uh, in my home church, if you didn't go to the prayer room before service, you didn't play. <laughs> Some people, I want old time Pentecost. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. You'd, you'd get offended. You'd get offended, Buttercup. You'd get offended. Amen. And so my pastor, ever so often, he'd slip out of the office. He'd walk through the prayer room, just kind of observe what was going on in there, and then he'd slip back in the office. I have seen him go up to people as they were on their way up to the platform, 
and tap them and say, I don't think you need to go up there tonight. You didn't pray. We put a lot of emphasis on prayer and revival churches, book of Acts churches. This starts, it's not about a UPC custom. This started in the book of Acts. They were continually going to the temple, Peter and John, the, 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 the miracle, the lame man. Uh, they were on their way to pray. And so these churches, I watched and I seen a strong prayer culture. That's probably a better term, a prayer culture in the church. And they had certain people in that church that were leaders in prayer. They were intercessors. And so let me challenge you here today, okay? Let me challenge you. We put a lot of emphasis on, and please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, but we put a lot of emphasis on talents and abilities and stuff. But one of the most vital, important things in a Pentecostal church is prayer warriors and intercessors. You have to have prayer. You have to have prayer. And, and I'll tell you something else that I've noticed. A lot of times when you start watching a formation in a local church, the scripture says that a threefold core is not easily broken. And I've watched to where there'll be three, at least three prayer warriors connect. Now, I've watched three gossips connect, too. Amen. But the, the fact is, is they connect because it enhances its spiritual momentum. So I'm encouraging you here today that this is the first thing, is it was a church of prayer. Everybody said amen. amen. God has called you amen. to intercessory. Yes. Amen. It's a call. It's a call. So I encourage you here today to be a church prayer. Everybody say prayer. prayer. You ready for the next one? Yes. Worship. Yes. They were worshipers, not watchers. Yes. The Father seeketh such to. Uh oh, I've lost a bunch of you right there. The Father seeketh such to worship, worship him. Didn't say the Father seeketh such to watch him. If you got a worshiper and a watcher in the same service, the worshiper will leave seeing a completely different picture. Because if you study the scripture, uh, Hebrews 11 and 6, for without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The term cometh to, if you look on your Strong's Concordance, it derives down and includes the word worship. So he that worships God must believe that he is and that as God, he is a rewarder or he reveals himself, he manifests himself to those that, you ready for it, worship him. So when it starts, and this is a chronological order, look at where it's at in history. Adam and Eve have messed up. This is from the very beginning. God establishes how to find him. If you want to find God, you're not going to find him through your intellect. You're going to find him in worship. Now, it's going to mess with your intellect, and he's going to show you some stuff. So I didn't say disengage your brain, but what I am saying is, is you can't just come to God and say, I'm going to understand God analytically, and I'm going to understand God intellectually, and just sit down and connect all the dots. It doesn't work that way. You've got to come to him and worship. And churches that worships, I mean they worship. It's not sporadic. It's not when they feel like it. It's not when they're having a good day. It's not when it's a pretty day. It's not when, well, I don't like you and all this stuff and all. But they, they create a culture of worship. Now, I'm messing with some of you here today already. I can tell you in the Holy Ghost, I'm messing with some of you. Because you've got your excuses on why you don't believe you have to worship. But he does say, are you, now you're ready for this one? We find God through our worship. Guess how God finds us? Worship. John 4, talking to the woman, the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship him in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Hebrews 11 and 6, man seeking God. John 4, God seeking man. And guess what the key ingredient there is? It's worship. So when God comes to church, 
and he does. When he comes to church, he starts observing the worshipers. This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a worshiper. If the church is not worshiping, God is not revealing himself to that church, and they don't see anything about God. All they see is just other people and things they like and things they don't like. I've also noticed that people that worship do not have the tendency to be near as critical as other people about the church service and what's taking place. So I'm encouraging this church. Number one, prayer. Number two, worship. They were worshiping churches. Amen. Everybody good? Ready to go to another one? Fellowship and community. And in my notes, I put community and I spelled unity at the end of it with capital letters. Community. You know, you, the blood flows through the body. The blood flows through the body. Uh, I, I watch this. I watch this. I watch this. This is a principle that I live by, especially in our local church. When I see the Holy Ghost move and the body moves, and then I see people not moving with it. Now, I understand there's just times people going through things and all that stuff and all. But when I know they're not connected to the body, the body's doing this and over here doing something totally opposite. Now, you got one or two things going on. Either they're totally disconnected from the body, they're not even in touch with it, or they just like attention. I mean, if the whole body's moving this way and you're over here doing something totally opposite, you might want to back up and say, hey, why am I operating independent of the body? I, this is probably too much stuff for a Sunday morning. I don't know. Why, why am I operating so you get disconnected? Because here's the thing. The blood flows through the body. Blood flows through fellowship. We just took communion. We just discerned the Lord's body. That's not just the body of Christ as far as Jesus is concerned, but that's also this body. And if we don't have a sense of community, and let me tell you something, you have to learn how to protect that community because there's some that want to come in and so discord among the brethren and they want to break the fellowship and they want to break the unity. And once that happens, everything starts breaking down. Now you have divisions in the church. Uh-oh. It's not a new problem, so don't act like oh, we're the only ones that got problems. Nope, nope, nope. Corinthians had a lot of problems. And I'm glad they had a lot of problems because they help us solve problems. But the deal is there's a bunch of people in that church. You know what they said? We're of Cephas. Peter baptized us. Simon Peter baptized us. Others said we're of Paul. Others said we're of Apollos. And then there was the spiritual folks in the church that said we are of Christ. We get ours direct. And that group was the most dangerous group in the Corinthian church. And Paul knew there was divisions in the Corinthian church. Mm. Wow. And the enemy knows how to hinder the move of God. Listen to me. Listen. If you forget everything else, I want you to remember this. The enemy knows how to make your prayer powerless. And the way he makes it powerless, number one is, well, the overall picture of this is when you don't love each other. Because when you get to the epistles of John, John says, if your heart condemn thee not, then is thou confidence toward God that whatsoever things we ask, we receive. What John is saying is, if you got something in your heart toward a brother, your heart is condemning you, and you can go pray about whatever you want to pray for, but it's not going to do anything. And it is the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man that availeth much. Then in the same passage to there, he says, confess your faults one to another, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Now, I've been in Pentecostal church services where they took that literal. We used to have old-fashioned confession services. The Holy Ghost get to moving people. I need to confess. I robbed the bank last week. I need to confess. 
And that usually wasn't it. It was usually other stuff. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> then some people got mad because after they confessed, they wish they hadn't have confessed. But if you look at it, now this is me, and this is what I believe it means, confess your fault. If you take that same word and you go back to Matthew 18, about if you have ought against a brother, if you read down through there, it doesn't just say ought, it also says if you have a fault. So I think, now here's the deal, the enemy knows if he can get you at odds with each other, and if he can even get the pew and the pulpit at odds with each other, he knows he's rendering you powerless. Is this, is this too much? He's rendering you powerless. Because you can't have something in your heart towards somebody else. And this is the whole scripture. He said, you leave your gift at the what? At the altar. And you go to them and you take care of this. And if they don't receive that, then you go get some witnesses. And then you do that. And if you still doesn't fix it, take it before the church. And then the next couple verses down there, it says, and where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be in their midst. That's not a good verse for us to start a low attendance church service. What that means is if you'll just do what I've told you to do and you'll get the witnesses and you get this fixed, I'll be in your midst. But until you get this fixed, I'm not going to be in your midst. So let me help some of you. If there's somebody coming to you that's trying to cause division or discord or sow disharmony, you're foolish. I'll just put it that way. If you continue to listen to them. Because if you let them get in your spirit, they'll destroy your faith. Then when you come to church, you can't worship, you can't pray. You're too busy playing detective. Mm. So community, unity. You want to see a commanded blessing, show me a church that has unity. Everybody still good? I, I don't know if you can get a refund or not for today, amen. You ready for the next one? Yes. Apostles' doctrine. They were strong in doctrine. I didn't say conviction, but doctrine. They were strong in doctrine. It's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. They believed in repentance. They believed in baptism in Jesus' name. They believed in the filling of the Holy Ghost evidence by speaking in tongues. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I'm not interested in continuing steadfastly in the UPC's doctrine, but I am interested in continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which I believe the UPC happens to preach. So they're strong doctrinal churches. I preached in a church uh, several years ago that was really kind of, we call it going down the slippery slope and changing a lot of stuff and all. So the pastor had me come in and said, I want you to come preach. And I really wrestled with even going. But the first Sunday I was there, I taught a 40 minute Bible study on the new birth, gave an altar call and prayed. I don't remember, it was like 52 people through the Holy Ghost. After the service, we're out eating at the restaurant fellowship breaking of bread and we're eating at the restaurant and the pastor was so ecstatic and this is what he said I, I've never seen anything like it you didn't even hardly raise your voice and we had all these people get the Holy Ghost the man sitting across from us happened to be the pastor's personal airplane pilot and he got the Holy Ghost that morning so the pastor looked at him and said what's so special about today that you got the Holy Ghost today and this man sincerely looks at his pastor and says today's the first day I actually knew I had to have it Now, I'm not saying we cram doctrine down people's throat, but I am saying the churches that are having a book of Acts revival, nothing changes at the same pattern. You still with me? You ready for the next one? Apostolic ministry. They were open to apostolic ministry. You know, I, I used to have a couple guys, especially come through Old Mogey. And they were prophets. I mean, they were the real deal. Now, prophets don't necessarily just come tell you the future. The prophets have a tendency to see. Sometimes they see things you don't want them to see. <laughs> and uh, matter of fact, the Old Testament, when a prophet would show up at the gates of the city, the, the city would send messengers out to him with an offering and say, have you come in peace? 
Because a lot of times when a prophet showed up, it wasn't always prophesying to you that you're going to get a better job. I mean, like David, thou art the man. And so I had a couple of these guys. All I had to do to get the church to pray through was just announce they were coming. Hey, Brother Jerome Bourne's coming. I mean, Brother, they hit the altar right there. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Forgive me. Forgive me for all the sin of my life. Because these old boys, they had a tendency, man. I mean, they could read your mail. See, I told you, you don't want old, old school Pentecost. Amen. And uh, so apostolic ministry is very much a part of it. Five-fold ministry has to be in the local church. Now, sometimes it operates in the local church, but most of the time it's about men coming in and holding an office. Let me explain something to you that might help you here a little. Is this, is this too far out there for y'all here today? Let me explain something to you. That man right there holds the office in this church as pastor. Shepherd, overseer. But God will send other people now. It's not that he can't use him in these things, but that's his gifting. But God will send other people in here that may hold the office of an apostle or may hold the office of a prophet or even a teacher or an evangelist. I believe that just as much as God calls him to hold the office of pastor in this church, that he's called other men to hold in this church an office. And when those men come, they connect. Am I making sense? There's, there, there's no way that we can... So, edify and perfect the church and equip you for your ministry without the, the strong operation of five-fold ministry in the church. Now, I guess what I'm wrestling with here today is you're going to have to decide if you want to be a Book of Acts church or just a good old UPC church. Now, am I making sense? Amen. You want to keep going? Well, that's... Uh, Man, I feel like I'm failing you here today. How about faith? It's church of faith. I mean, man, they, they now I tie these two together. I mean, they follow one another. Faith and then the next one's vision. Vision. These were churches that once the vision was spoke, it's kind of like Habakkuk. He said, Habakkuk, here's your job. Here's your job. You write the vision and make it plain. It's their responsibility to run with it until it's appointed time. So anytime that God speaks to the man of God and gives him a vision for the church or a word for the church, then it becomes the responsibility of the church to run with it and not drop it or abort it and to run with it to make sure that it's being accomplished. And if that's the case, then you got to have faith. So they're churches of strong vision. I won't give you two cents for a church that does not have a strong vision. People just come. They're just, I'm stirring something up in the spirit here today. People just come and they're comfortable with coming to church and they like two or three songs. They like a little spasm of prayer. They like a little sermonette, something that's predictable and all that stuff and all. And every once in a while, we might even get moved to come to the altar and pray a little bit. And, and you know, and another thing is, uh, you know, we got to pray a couple people through a year because people move off or people die. So we got to keep our attendance up here, but that's as bad as far as we want to go. Why don't you tell that to San Leandro? Why don't you tell San Leandro in the Bay Area that we're very comfortable and we don't owe you to preach the gospel to you? Oh, it's quieter than quiet in here. We just get, I'm just being brutally honest with y'all here today. And I don't have anything to lose. I mean, you know, you can fire me after service. Amen. <laughs> but the deal is, I, you know, we, we, we're eat up with this stuff. We just want to have good church and, you know, it's some good programs and all this stuff and on. Then we get in holy competition. Who's going to get this job? Who's going to get that position? And the Holy Ghost is telling us, I want you to see the vision. It's not just even the pastor's vision. It's the vision of the Lord that he gives us. And then God says to the congregation, now do you want to see this fulfilled? It's not just going to happen because you wish it would happen. 
The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Anything you ever get from God, you've got to go after it. You've got to go after it. If not, we become very passive and just kind of easy going and we don't want to rock stuff and you know, and then you know, here we go. And so I'm just advocating here today that you watch very carefully Two or three things. Number one, watch people coming in that want to mess with the unity of the church. And then protect yourself that nothing takes the vision from you and that nothing takes your faith. There are certain people that come into churches that do nothing but destroy faith in the congregation. I'm, 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 I'm going to show you a little something here. Amen. So, you know, we're sitting, here's, here's how it works. You don't know how it works? So, you know, after church today, we all, a uh, few of us decide to go to uh, McDonald's. Amen. I don't recommend that, but we're going to McDonald's. And so we're sitting there and uh, somebody, and this is usually how it starts, Pastor. They usually start uh, kind of got a little tear trickling down and I'm just burdened about the church and I'm just, you know, I just troubled about some things. Well, well what's going on? Now, I'm telling you, I, I don't mean this bad and I'm not gossiping, but I just feel this and I, I need to share it with you. Okay. Well, I've noticed that we take offerings, a lot of offerings in our church. Mm -hmm. But I've also noticed that after every offering we take, Sister Pritt comes in with a new pair of shoes. Now, I'm not saying, but it's just the way it looks. Now, come on, let's be honest in here today. Let your guard down a little bit. So now, the next time you come to church, you can't worship. Well, you might worship. You kind of get out in the aisle and like, oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And all you're doing, just going down here, look, oh, my God. She's got on new shoes. That's all it takes. All it takes is somebody just planting a negative seed into your brain for all of a sudden they start messing with your faith and then you start getting accusatorial and, and all the stuff starts taking place and all. Listen, I'm just telling you, you know, I, I, I've, I'm reminding you, I've been at this a long time. I've been at this a long time. I've seen it over and over and over. You got, you got to guard yourself to allow people into your life that's going to plant seeds of discord in your life. Now, I'm going to go a little further with that one, okay? Because here's the deal. Most apostolic churches would say that homosexuality is considered in the scripture an abomination. Now, I know we're in the Bay Area. Oh, God, Brother Morgan, be careful. I'm telling you what the Bible says. The Bible calls it an abomination. Now, I had a young man one time show up at church, and he said, well, the Bible says eating crawfish is an abomination, or shrimp is an abomination, or lobster is an abomination. I said, it does. It, it does. I said, well, what are y'all going to do about that? I said, we're going to look at the Scripture. He said, well, we are looking at it. I said, okay, then watch this. It says homosexuality is an abomination unto God. You eating lobster is an abomination unto you. And I said, there's a big difference. Well, that went over real well. Amen. There's a big difference. But the same Bible that says homosexuality is an abomination also says he that soweth discord is an abomination unto God. Because homosexuality sows discord in nature and, and the other one sows discord in brotherhood. You've got to protect it. You've got to protect it. Is, is this okay? You, you, you got it. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Uh, are we planning on going to that Mexican restaurant after church today? <laughs> if you say no, I'm going to go a long time and forget eating. But if you say yes, then I'm fixing the cut. I'm fi <laughs> you want to go a little further? Altar. Churches with an altar. Now I know you're saying, well, you covered prayer a while ago. Prayer and the altar are not synonymous. You can pray but not have an altar. But if you've got an altar, you'll pray. 
The altar's where you die, where there's a sacrifice. Now, this is the biggest battle that we have, and this is a battle that we're having here today even with a few of you, is it's called self-will. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You cannot find the will of God until you go to the altar. And when you go to the altar, you take your will and what you want and you take it and you put it on the altar and you leave it there and you ask God to send his consuming fire to consume your will and what you want. And then when he consumes it, he establishes and gives back to you his will, which according to, uh, what's the book there, uh, Romans, he says that this is a better way to think. So what happens in congregations is you have people that become self-willed. This is how we ought to do it. This is the way that it ought to go. This is how you should preach. This, 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 and this. They never go to the altar to put what they want on the altar and to die out to what they want to have established in their life the will of God. So people that have no altar have no fire. If you have no fire, it's because... There's no altar and there's nothing being put on the altar because the fire of God falls as a consuming fire to consume what you put on the altar. And the hardest thing any of us have to do is, is for us to die out to our will and to do the will of God. I say Jesus didn't die on the cross. I say that Jesus died in the garden. Jesus actually died when he said this, If it's possible, let this cup pass. But nonetheless, not my will. There it was, right there. You just died. Not my will, but thy will be done. And churches have to decide. Listen, when the will of God is being preached to you, which is that vision, this is where God wants to take us. This is what God wants to do. This is where God, what the things that God wants to give us. Well, God's establishing that. He's establishing his will. But if you're not careful, you'll have your own will. And there's a clash that happens, which makes you king. It means you sit on your own throne. You rule your own life. And then a lot of people carry that into the church. You're so used to doing it your way and your stubborn nature that you just, I mean, people know you for that. You're just strong-willed, strong-willed, and you're going to do it your way. And then you bring that into the church. But I got news for you. You're not fighting against the pastor. You're not fighting against the church. You've picked a fight with God. Now it comes down to your will and his will. And trust me, one of these days your will's going to crumble and his will's going to keep right on going down the road. Ask yourself the question, what? Well, I don't know that you could do it without the altar. I started to say, ask yourself the question, what's the will of God for this church? Well, I'm, I'm going to keep messing with you, man. I done stirred this up so bad. You'll, you'll, I don't think we'll ever be able to fix it after this. Well, in the UPC... We got this magic number, 200. And if a church can just reach 200, they've made it. This is, the, this is our terminology. How, how are they doing there? Oh, man, they, they, they're running over 200. It's like 200 is this number that we've set that is the measure for success. Hmm. That's the go. If we just reach 200, that means we'll have good finances and we can do some things and we can have our own building and all this stuff and all. Man, I'm for all that. But if you take 200 and you trot it back over into the book of Acts and you go over to Jerusalem or Ephesus, Ephesus is numbered that they had at least 50,000 members. 
I'm messing with some of you so bad because you just want to reach 75 or 100 and you're happy. Where, where, who sets that? Is that your will? What's God's will for this church? What's God's will for this city? What's God's will for you? Now, the only way that can be established is you go to the altar, you die out, you accept his will, and you sacrifice. Ooh. Should, I, should I quit now and, and, and just say, oh, Lord, this thing was a train wreck. Amen. Yeah. One more thing about sacrifice. You want to go just a little step further with sacrifice? It's sacrificial giving. I've never seen a true book of Acts revival break out that there wasn't somewhere in it sacrificial giving. And honestly, with those churches, the book of Acts churches that are truly a book of Acts church, it's not a momentary one-time thing. It becomes a lifestyle. They set a pattern and a culture of continuously giving. They're just a giving church. Ooh, ooh. For God so loved the world, he... The last one on my list up there is love. Churches of love, charity. If you really love, you give. If you love the city, you give to it. If you love each other, you give to it. You can't walk up and say, I love you, because in the Greek, agape is a verb. You can only do it or show it. And these are the characteristics of churches. Now listen, I know we're here on a Sunday morning, and uh, we're far from 200 and all this stuff and all. I think that there is a struggle within this congregation to just live in a place of just comfort and ease. And we got a young pastor, and you know, he's got a lot of passion right now, but you know, he'll calm down. I hope not. And uh, we, you know, I know you, you know me, and we've been here a while, and, and uh, uh, what about the things of the Spirit? What about the things of God? Are, are, are we hungry for more of God? Are we desirous to explore the things of God? Because God is not a respect of persons. There's not one person in this building today that God is a respecter of. It means he loves you more than he loves somebody else. God is not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of hunger. And God only feeds us according to our appetite. So if you have an appetite for the things of God as a congregation, God will feed that to you. If you thirst and hunger after righteousness, you shall be filled. But churches that are already filled on contentment of life and and stuff and all, and there's no hunger for the things of God or no hunger for higher dimensions of God. Listen, I'm gonna tell you something. If you think we're gonna hit that world out there with just a good old church service, I hate to tell you that's not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. We need, we need a true demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God, and the church has got to explore the depths of God, and this is the only way I know how to put it. You gotta get out of the shallow end of the pool and get over into the deep end of the pool where you can swim in waters that have power to heal. And, and, and all. Now, listen, I'm not here today trying to rough you up and be mean to you. I'm here today to challenge you. Because every church, if you're not careful, has a tendency to just kind of push all this other stuff off. Let's just have a good church service every other Sunday or one Sunday a month. Let's have a good church service because we need it to fix us. It's, it's got to become a lifestyle. It's got to become, we're going after it. This Sunday, we're going after it. It's Wednesday night, I don't know if, what you have. We're going after it, please God. I'm going after it. And I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to challenge some of you to step out of just that area of comfort and to start going for the things of God and saying, you know what? I want to do the will of God in my life more than I want to do anything else. And this is what I feel like God's calling me to do. Ooh. Now, I've given you nine or 10 things. My question to you today is, what are you gonna do with it? You can, you can 
go meet somebody after church and discuss it and say, I, I just don't think he's got it right. Come over and tell us all that stuff. And, all right, right, you know. I'm trying to challenge you today. I'm trying to get you. And I know God's been doing some things, but you haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what God's going to do. You know, I, I can only speak for myself, and I try to be careful when I go down this road. But I, I'm, I'm kind of in a predicament right now because pre-COVID, we had these numbers. Post-COVID, we dropped down to here. And after a while, empty pews start bugging me. Because of what I see in the scripture is the church in advancing something. It's always advancing. It's always taking new territory. And it ought to be something that stirs you. It ought to stir you to good works. It ought to stir you to intercessory prayer. It ought to stir you to say, I'm going to be fervent in my worship toward God. I'm going to be a person of prayer. True apostolic book of Acts revival comes out of that culture of prayer. Azusa came out of a prayer meeting. This is where it's going to happen. And I heard y'all talking about communion and prayer and fasting and all that stuff and all. And that's one of the most key vital things that you can do to break out of it. Now listen, here's the deal, folks. Every church battles with these things. Even these churches that I'm talking about having revival and all this stuff and all. There's still something in them that wars against them trying to pull them down. But I've noticed this. Somebody asked me the other day what I noticed. And I very seldom mention names, but you know, you were there a lot, Brother Keys, when they were having their revival Modesto. What did you notice about it? I said, what I noticed the most about it was Brother Keys never let up. He constantly kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing. He constantly was challenging the church. He constantly was in revival. Ooh. There were revivals there. He'd have two or three evangelists in the same week. I've preached there with Brother Godwin. I've preached there with Brother McLean. I, I, I don't know who all. Keith Clark, I mentioned names, some of you don't have any idea. But the deal is, is it was just this deal, and he, he was never satisfied. You just never reach a certain place and say, okay, that's it. We've done everything that we need to do because as long as there's lost humanity in the world, the church has a responsibility. The church has a job. Can I at least get a good Baptist nod here today? I'm telling you, this is our responsibility. If this is your church, you have to own it. Brother Morgan, I'm just not, well, don't believe that lie. I'm done. Don't believe that lie. Don't believe that lie. So you know what? God picked me. I'm here. And God knows who's here. So you know what? I'm going to do it. Well, it's not my nature. There's a lot of things not my nature, but the Holy Ghost sure helps me to do it. Amen. And you know what? When you just like, you know what I'm going after? So I want to challenge all you young men and men here today. Go after it. See it. Pursue it. Get a passion for it. Hunger for it. I refuse just to live life at this level. I refuse just to status quo. I refuse just to accept a few things from God and just learn to live with that. When there are depths that I can explore and there's places that I can go and there's channels that I've never been in of the spirit and I plan on getting there some way or another and I want God to create an appetite within us. Let me tell you what I feel in the Holy Ghost right now. You guys have had some good services and I know that, well, where do they go? <laughs> I mean, one week we have this, and then the next week it's not, and then this, and then not, and this and all. Let me tell you what I've learned about God. Uh, the worst thing anybody can do is give you some food that you really like as an appetizer. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, brother, you get hooked on it. I mean, once you taste it, it creates an appetite for it. The problem is a lot of times you can't afford it. <laughs> but the deal is, is it creates an appetite. So what God does in churches is he visits and he allows you to explore this and to touch it and to taste it. And what he's trying to do is create within you an appetite that says, I want that. 
And so he'll allow this to happen in the spirit or he'll allow you to have a really strong, powerful spiritual experience. And boy, you just kind of like to stay there and camp there, kind of like Simon Peter, let's build three tabernacles and camp right here on the Mount of Transfiguration. But the fact is he gave you a taste of it. And then he tells you, you can have this. Now it's gonna cost you something to get it, but you can have it. You can go after it. You got a hunger for it now. And when God starts moving in a powerful manifestation, what he's doing is, is he's creating an appetite. And what you have to say is, you know what? This can be more than sporadic. If I'll just go after and say, I want that, and I plan on getting that every service, I'm telling you right now, the next thing you know, it'll be at the table every time you sit down to eat. Let's praise him. Let's praise him here, man. Let's praise him. Go on, lift your voice and praise him. How hungry are you for the presence of God and the things of God? That's it, go on after it, go on after it. Pursue it. What you hungry for today in the spirit? <laughs> 